What's up guys, we got the late night beats tonight. Mm -hmm. You know? Dance it out on live. So all right, what's up guys? Let's get this thing going. Hope everybody's had a great Tuesday. And jump on in. Cool, so tonight we celebrate not just advancements in health, but the power of human resilience and innovation. We're diving deep into New York's groundbreaking decision to offer birth control without prescriptions. It's a seismic shift in women's healthcare, a beacon of autonomy and empowerment. As your trusted guide, I'll unravel the complexities of this move, highlighting its profound impact. Next in our tech talk, we confront a pressing issue that intertwines technology with our well-being. The alarming cybersecurity breach at Change Healthcare. Here, I'm going to blend some expert science with critical analysis decoding the implications of this breach on our healthcare systems and just what healthcare providers decided to start doing about it. A stark reminder of the digital era's challenges underscoring the need for robust cyber defenses. Our Enlightenment Hour pays homage to Women's History Month. We spotlight Mary Beatrice Davidson Kenner, an unsung hero whose inventions revolutionized daily conveniences. Her story isn't just about innovation, it's a testament to overcoming adversity with unwavering determination. In the Herbal Wellness Corner, we delve into the therapeutic of cannabis, therapeutic potential of cannabis for women's health issues. I'm going to share insights backed by science exploring how natural alternatives can offer solace from the discomforts of menopause, menstrual cramps, and endometriosis. The community spotlight shines on the Game Billiards grand opening ribbon cutting today, celebrating communal joy and engagement in a space designed for everyone. Finally, our Men's Health Minute takes an intriguing turn, addressing the often overlooked topic of a male hormonal changes. We'll break down myths and provide factual insights in regards to the male period, fostering a comprehensive understanding of men's health. Join us as we navigate these compelling topics armed with knowledge and a spirit of curiosity. Together, let's shape a healthier, more informed world. Stay engaged, stay curious, and more importantly, stay empowered. Thank you very much to our show sponsors, Farm True, High Horse Cannabis Company, Vada Speedway Park, and The Baked Chicken Farm for their unwavering support in our shared mission for better health. This is Dr. Martini Costa, ready to embark on this informative odyssey with you. Let's dive in. So, bada boom. Anybody else see that? You know, New York officially released the O pill as the, you know, birth control option for all New York citizens. This is going to be, you know, actually pretty dang interesting overall because, you know, online pharmacies and this, that, and the other all of a sudden increase a lot of potential access, you know, for people really looking to obviously have birth control available. All good, but what there should we be considering, you know, in terms of making healthcare decisions independently and autonomy is awesome. This is something that, you know, we absolutely celebrate, but as a healthcare provider, I mean, you know, if people are going to be taking their own healthcare journeys, of course, you know, it's my job to inform, you know, and be there for people. So again, you know, when you do birth control, you know, consultations, Luckily, in our beautiful state of New Mexico, pharmacists have the prescriptive authority to prescribe birth control, something I've been able to do over the last couple of years. You know, checking blood pressure, checking past medical history of cardiovascular disease, you know, cigarette, tobacco, smoking, age, you know, verifying all that. Sure. You know, kind of root and drill. But it also gives you a different opportunity as well to, you know, have an intervention point with somebody who may not have had health care for a little while. And I think that's you know, an important thing that we don't necessarily want to overlook. And as much as we want autonomy, you know, are we using, you know, over the counter birth control to skip going to the doctor? You know, men already have this problem where, you know, men don't want to go to the doctor. We're trying to be more like women so that, you know, we go to the doctor and what happens after that, we actually start living longer, right? Women are out living men six to seven years in the United States of America. You know, the literal, not only economic impacts, but, you know, societal impacts of you know, men not taking care of themselves is a true thing. And we talk about it on the show, you know, quite often to say the least. And, um, you know, very important things to kind of 
dissect here as we look at you know the O pill, right? A uh, progestin only birth control that's now over the counter, um, approved by the FDA, available in New York at drugstores, convenience stores, grocery stores, and online. So you know one concern about it being available in New York online is it going to probably going to end up selling to everywhere in the country? Absolutely, right? I would imagine it's probably even available as of right now and you can order down to New Mexico and it's cool, great, you know, bypass the doctor appointment and whatnot. However, you know, as there's just some things that we just want to discuss, right? So Opil, is the new birth control right for you, right? And that's, those are questions that you don't necessarily get to, you know, weigh with anybody when you're able to create an over-the-counter option. Right, so a progestin only birth control works by affecting ovulation so that the ovaries do not re release an egg every month. They thicken cervical mucus, which blocks sperm from reaching the egg and change the uterine lining to keep the fertilized egg from implanting. And, you know, as opposed to estrogen containing birth control pills or combo pills, right, um, it becomes a situation because, you know, estrogen and those hormones get linked to cancer, right? Or cardiovascular issues. And these are the things you want to stray away from, you know, if anybody is susceptible. And so, you know, where the general safest, um, you know, birth control option is now, you know, pretty much available OTC. You know, it's still some things to consider there. Is this kind of a one size fits all situation? Or, you know, are we perhaps overlooking maybe some things there at, at certain points that should be just a little bit better communicated, right? So New York, permitting pharmacists to provide contraceptives without requiring prescriptions under an order approved Tuesday. State Health Commissioner, Dr. James McDonald signed the order, which is effective immediately. Four page order essentially serves as a pharmacist prescription for the whole state according to the governor's office and the directive covers oral hormonal contraceptives, hormonal contraceptive vaginal rings and hormonal contraceptive patch patches. Big moment for women in New York. Hochul, the first woman to serve as New York's governor said at a news conference in Albany Pharmacy. Starting today, any woman walking into a New York State pharmacy will be able to purchase birth control, the best control birth control method that meets her needs. It's a new era. You know, what's the over-the-counter approved one that doesn't require any pharmacist oversight? It's called Opil. So that's still out there. Last year, the Food and Drug Administration authorized the first birth control pill for non-prescription use in the USA, and Hocho made expanding reproductive freedoms a priority of her administration after the Supreme Court erased the federal right to abortion in 2022. Most Americans supported the national abortion right according to polling and Democrats across the nation are aiming to center reproductive rights in the November elections. And, you know, again, this is something I'm looking at from the scope of a you know, very neutral healthcare provider that I'm not trying to impart any sort of political views on by any means. You know, I just want to, you know, compare and contrast certain things when it comes to you know, what we end up selecting. And perhaps if you're going to be able to shop online, right, for birth control, which one are you going to be getting? It's going to be called the O pill, you know, and again, is the how this is the, I think, major question people need to take a look at. How effective is the O pill at preventing pregnancy? Perfect use means taking the pill every single day at the same time. With perfect use, it's 98% effective, meaning if 100 people take the medication perfectly, two or fewer people will become pregnant. Taking a pill perfectly can be difficult though. Typical use averages how well a method works to prevent pregnancy when real people use it in real life. It considers that people sometimes use the pill inconsistently, like forgetting a dose or not taking it at all. At the same time of day, typical use, O-pill is about 91% effective, meaning if 100 people use O-pill but don't take it perfectly, at least nine can become pregnant in a year, right? So again, if you you know, miss a pill when it comes to birth control, oftentimes, you know, you're able to call the pharmacy and, you know, sometimes you get directed back to your med guides and things like that, but it's nice to have somebody to bounce that off of. You know, when you're out there shopping for yourself, you know, you get caught in a pinch or whatever and life starts going really fast, how oftentimes are you gonna call and check with that other healthcare provider, right? And so those are, you know, slightly some of the concerns that I have is that maybe, the rollout could be a little bit more romanticized than expected, you know, and a missed pill here and there, all of a sudden all around the country starts becoming, you know, the opposite of the intention of perhaps more pregnancies and whatever happens from there, right? So just very interesting to things to concern, you know, again, 
progestin only pills, you know, behind the counter have been otherwise known as like, right, um, mini pill, you know, anyways, if you're concerned about taking estrogen, you may be, you know, worried about your risk, past or present risk for things like breast cancer, you may have certain liver disease, have unexplained uterine bleeding, or you may even live, literally take medications, right, for like TB or HIV that, you know, can be affected by the processing of those other estrogen based medications. If you have a history of blood clots in the legs or the lungs, right? If you're a smoker, those are great reasons to look at progestin only. So, you know, is it a one size fits all solution? Not quite. And I really hope that, you know, the pharmacist intervention gets utilized, right? But again, I think people are going to be looking for the easy way out. I don't think people are going to be, you know, trying to go up to the pharmacy counter and get a full consultation as much as you think they would. You know, on the back end where I've had been able to run this service here in this state of New Mexico, you know, it doesn't quite happen as often as you would think, right? And, you know, really when you get in those situations is when maybe someone's in a lapse with their insurance and they're not able to you know, re-up on their birth control prescription and they use you for a one-off and they already know what they've been on. Right. And maybe, you know, those situations are fine. And again, you can just kind of keep people on what they should be on, you know, but again, you still look at rolling out new things with new things comes you know, new questions. And so those are some of the interesting things there. I think on top of perhaps side effects, including things like irregular bleeding, acne, um, decrease sex drive, depression, headaches, Right, nausea, these things can happen, you know, and um, there, has, there can be more management that needs to be really considered, right? If you, for instance, um, skip two days, if basically with the progestin pill, you can actually perhaps consider, you know, skipping two days of, you know, sexual activity on the right first day of your menstrual period and create different situations of management and, you know, managing the side effects, right? And so this starts becoming very layered, you know, and very personalized. And so all of a sudden, maybe TikTok, maybe Reddit will have some of these answers and who knows how that'll change, right? Because shoot, everybody had their own answers when it came to Ozempic, right? When it came to Manjaro, they already did their own homework by the time they got there, whether they knew what they're talking about or not. But you know, the internet makes you feel pretty confident. So, you know, as daily life goes by, where a in the state of New Mexico, when you get a prescription, you have to be offered pharmacist consultation, you know, so therefore you can accept or deny it, right? And, you know, that's on record at any new prescription, right? So when you're think, talking about things like over-the-counter online pharmacies, you know, quick, easy access, all of a sudden you're kind of cutting out healthcare intervention. Even though you're increasing healthcare access, we may not have perhaps closed the gap there. Those are my concerns, but minus the concerns, I'm happy to see, you know, a use case in a state with, you know, tens of millions of people. And we're gonna really, you know, see how this rolls out, whether it's um, great and awesomely effective or whether we hit some bumps in the road. You know, my personal opinion is that perhaps it will be there will be some cloudy moments, but I think as the overall whole, right, we're looking at a good move. And so that's my birth control spiel for the day. And we're going to continue on talking a little bit about some of this stuff. It's also, right, Women's History Month, March is Women's History Month. So we're going to be talking a little about, you know, cannabis and women's health and, you know, influential women when it comes to women's health, cough, cough, Mary Beatrice, Davidson, Kenner, right? And then we'll even close the show by talking about, you know, man periods. And this is not to say by any means that men suffer from any of the, you know, any of these side effects in any of the same amount of ways by any means, but, you know, just interesting hormonal changes to consider here. So as we've talked about the change healthcare cyber attack that really ended up affecting those you know, in our country who really are putting it on the line the most, AKA our military families, you know, all your TRICARE patients are the ones that are still suffering to this day, having to wait from their, right, um, military pharmacies, you get medications, 
and it's just a giant mess. And out in the public, they may be paying cash out front for these medications, or perhaps certain pharmacies are working with them to figure it all out. But again, TRICARE was one of these huge affected pharmacies with this giant data breach that happened. Anyways, you know, what I was kind of excited about to see and advertise, not or see in an advertisement, right, was this Gibbs Law Group filing class action lawsuits on behalf of healthcare providers harmed by change healthcare data breach. So, you know, I just got an ad for it this morning talking about were, were you a healthcare provider who was affected by the change data breach? You know, for damn sure if you are, you know, this is one actual way to clap, clap back at that and perhaps even make a difference, right? And so, you know, where have we seen, you know, all the ads for things like mesothelioma or hit by a truck called Chuck or whatever it may be, right? You know, this perhaps is actually, in my humble opinion, a great use of legal action against, you know, the big PBMs from an angle that they perhaps didn't even consider when they're sitting there lobbying against, you know, everything in the entire world to continue to fill their pockets. And so you know, all of a sudden they get taken down and are vulnerable, you know, perhaps maybe them being exposed just a little bit would be, you know, beneficial for the whole when it's all said and done. So healthcare providers, right? You know, if your business has been impacted by any means with this data breach, you know, perhaps there's a little something there for you. And what I think, you know, needs to be the next step is I'd like to see, you know, TRICARE, military families, you know, anybody else affected, represented from the patient side. And I think that's definitely something that hopefully we can see here in the future and, and really um, hopefully make some positive change there. Because again, our nation's health data needs to be protected, right? We were talking about yesterday, you know, the FTC claims against GoodRx and slap on the wrist and a $1.5 million fine for the fact that GoodRx sold everybody's, you know, health data to Facebook, Google, all the big guys, and you know, all the identifiers, they had you, you know, pretty much targeted by whatever drugs that you took and everything, right? And so that's a very, you know, awkward, you know, in country situation of just kind of, you know, data breaches. And so obviously we do not know the originators of the change healthcare data breach. And of course, these are the things that while it's still completely not under control, we're not going to really have any idea about, you know, really the attacks that are, that are coming there. But again, it's something to be concerned about because right, when you start disrupting the flow of things, you know, things start getting out of control. And then on top of the fact that that data is worth something to somebody, right, in the wrong hands, it can, it's just, it's stuff that we don't even want to consider. So hopefully this creates a situation where our, you know, HIPAA security and, you know, any sort of data privacy when it comes to healthcare actually, you know, really, really gets protected in-house in our own country, you know, and whatever ways that that should and could be. So we'll see. Hopefully it's not just a measly slap on the wrist and maybe some, you know, settlements, but this perhaps could be pretty layered. And I have a funny feeling it is going to be, especially just by the nature of, of the beast. So let's move on to our enlightenment hour, guys, celebrating in Women's History Month. Mary Beatrice Davidson Kenner, the innovator of the sanitary belt, the walker and the toilet tissue holder, the medical device, you know, queen of her time. So let's talk a little bit about her inventions. Give her a little shout out today. Awesome, right? Mary Beatrice Davidson Kenner was a remarkable 20th century inventor. Who received five patents. In spite of enduring racism her entire life, she succeeded in patenting inventions that made every day easier. Her inventions include the sanitary belt, predecessor to the maxi pad, a serving tray and pocket that connect to a walker and a toilet paper holder that ensures the loose end of the toilet paper is within reach. Thank you. Anna was born into a family of inventive thinkers on May 7th, 1912 in Monroe, North Carolina. Her father, Sidney Nathaniel Davidson, patented a clothing presser in 1914 that could fit into a suitcase. Her maternal grandfather, Robert Fromberger, invented a tricolor light signal for trains and a stretcher with wheels for ambulances. Oh, gee. Can her sister, Mildred Davidson Alden Austin Smith, grew up to patent a board game in 1980, and as a young child, Kenner was always coming up with creative solutions to problems. At the precious age of six, she attempted to invent a self-oiling door hinge. 
Other childhood inventions included putting up a sponge at the tip of an umbrella to soak up rainwater and a portable ashtray to attach to a cigarette pack. You know, so taking a look at her patent of the walker, how cool is that? Looking at all those little figures there. U.S. patent number 3957071. In 1924, the Davidson family moved to Washington, D.C. and Kenner graduated from Dunbar High School in 1931. She enrolled at Howard University, but subsequently dropped out due to financial constraints. To make ends meet, she held various jobs and became a federal employee during World War II. After the war, Kenner became a professional florist while simultaneously inventing in her free time. In 1951, Kenner married James Jabo Kenner, and the couple fostered five children, eventually adopting one son. Kenner's first patent came in 1957 for the sanitary belt, which was used to hold sanitary napkins in place. This was before adhesive maxi pads and tampons were invented. Although Kenner had invented the sanitary belt years before, she could not afford to file for a patent, and she experienced racism in her quest to obtain a patent. One day I was contacted by a company that expressed an interest in marketing my idea. I was so jubilant, I saw houses, cars, and everything about to come my way, Kenner remarked in the Laura F. Jeffries book, Amazing American Inventors of the 20th Century. Sorry to say, when they found out I was black, their interest dropped. Kenner continued to invent in spite of obstacles in 1976. After her sister was diagnosed with MS, Kenner patented a walker with an attachable tray and pocketed for carrying items. In the 1980s, she invented the toilet paper dispenser with paper that was always reachable and a back washer that could be mounted to a shower wall. She passed away in January 13th, 06, in Washington, D.C. at the prime age of 93. Although she never received awards, fame, or wealth during her lifetime, her inventions had an enduring impact on everyday life. And they sure did. That's pretty awesome. So, you know, shout out to Mary Beatrice Davidson Kenner. I know, you know, up there in the sky, you actually, you got everything it was that you ever dreamed of. And we appreciate what you left for us here on this earth. Very awesome, right? Leading us to... Our herbal wellness quarter brought to you by High Horse Cannabis Company. You know, I wanted to go over a little bit of just talking about, you know, important stuff here and talking about today, you know, really going all the way deep on women's health. You know, when it came, comes to cannabis and we really look at what's out there, right, for treating symptoms of things like menopause, menstrual cramps, endometriosis. You know, you're looking at all the things that are kind of the enemy in my eyes, as much as you know, I've obviously never had a period cramp. And of course, you know, if you've got to do what you got to do, I'm not saying don't take NSAIDs, right? Like this has been the traditional use, right? Caffeine, NSAIDs, you know, endometriosis down to opioids, right? So absolutely, you know, I'm just, for those who perhaps, you know, might want to consider anything, even particularly a little safer, right? I think cannabis is a very, very good play. And that's what I want to talk about today in our Herbal Wellness Corner. So understanding women's wellness, wrote this, got our little blog up on our farmtree.care learn section, guys. And also while we're here in this segment, hope everybody comes out to see us at the High Horse Cannabis Company block party, guys, Saturday from 10 to 6 at the North Main location. You'll see me pumping this thing up all week. So for sure, right? So come, you know, check it out. We'll do a health screening. Shoot, I'll prescribe your birth control if you want, whatever you got to do. We'll be doing blood pressure blood pricks for diabetes screenings and general right medication management consultations obviously cannabis education is a part of it i can't even you know speak two sentences without that being a part of what i do so you know we're just here for you guys and we want to make sure that we keep it absolutely available and that's that's what it's all about so you know anyways women's health issues like menopause menstrual cramps endometriosis significantly impact quality of life right Often, traditional treatments such as NSAIDs and hormone replacement therapy are the first line of defense. However, they come with a slew of side effects and potential risks. In contrast, using cannabis for these critical women's health issues can be a much gentler alternative, providing effective relief with minimal risks. And we really, you know, try to unpack that, right? How and why, right? And perhaps, you know, this isn't for you. Perhaps you work at a job where you're drug tested or, you know, maybe it's just against your values while it's still federally illegal. And I completely understand that, right? This is not to go and change your mind in any of those ways, but for those you know, who can at least afford the, the mental energy to think about it a little bit, I think, you know, that's kind of where I wanted to end up this evening. Right. And, 
you know, that's what it's all about. So let me pull some, some good stuff here for you guys. All right, so pulling this up in terms of treatment strategies, but we're gonna take it all the way back up to, we're gonna start a menstrual cramps. And so, right, hormonal fluctuations throughout the menstrual cycle, obviously, and we're looking at four to five phases, menstrual days one to five, follicular six to 12, ovulatory 13 to 16, luteal day 17, to the premenstrual phase and the menstrual phase five days prior to menstrual breeding often included in the luteal phase right we learn about those maybe in fifth grade as young boys and we have no idea what's going on you know learn about this a little bit more in pharmacy school so you know that's where obviously we're <laughs> some of that back end understanding of that comes in but you know again you know females know their bodies and have been you know taught it pretty well for a pretty decently long time you know and it's I guess still a little perplexing to me as to why the options out there are just, you know, rather slim, you know, to say the least. And anyways, back to it. So Conventional medicine defines premenstrual syndrome or PMS, right, as recurrent, moderate psychological and physical symptoms that occur during the luteal phase of menses and resolve with menstruation affects 20 to 30 percent of premenopausal women. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder or PMDD is a more severe form of PMS characterized by debilitating symptoms that impact the one's relationships, social and occupational function. PMDD affects three to eight percent of premenopausal women. The following symptoms are associated with PMS and PMDD. Physical symptoms include abdominal bloating, appetite disturbance, breast tenderness, headaches, fatigue, muscle aches, and or joint pain, sleep disturbance, swelling of extremities. Psychological symptoms include anxiety, feeling overwhelmed or out of control, depressed mood, irritability, mood swings, feeling overwhelmed, sensitive to rejection, social withdrawal, sudden sadness or tearfulness. Fatigue, forgetfulness, or poor concentration. You know, if I'm missing anything on the list, feel free to add it on, right? But again, when we really, really start to look at the list, it actually starts to become obvious why so many women actually do consider and use cannabis to both address the physical and psychological symptoms of PMS and PMDD. What does an NSAID do to cut any of that out, right? Maybe caffeine wakes you up a little bit, releases some of the headache, sure, but again, now, women cannabis users with PMDD have been found to increase their cannabis use during the premenstrual and menstrual phases in association with the severity of depressive symptoms and motivation to cope. You know, why would I support it? Because it makes sense to reserve higher doses of cannabis for the time of the month when it's needed the most, right? To avoid building tolerance all month long and therefore maintaining effectiveness of the treatment. Secondly, right, anandamide levels actually, right, are bliss molecule. You know, THC is the plant version of what our body creates, aka anandamide levels, which decrease during the luteal phase, right? Likely due to progesterone-induced upregulation of FAAH, the enzyme that breaks down anandamide, right? Supplementing cannabis literally can be helpful and most needed when those levels are suppressed, right? We look at actual clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, your body's going into that state, right? When you're in the luteal phase, so it's very... You know, interesting to really take that science down to a T, right? And, you know, oftentimes we look at different phases of the symptoms and maybe really only attack one point and, you know, really look at an overall point, you know, we look at cannabis, right? Dysmenorrhea distinct from PMS and PMDD is defined as a presence of painful cramps originating in the universe that occur during menstruation. Studies shown that 45 to 93% of menstruating women experience some, some symptoms of dysmenorrhea and that three to 33% have symptoms severe enough to impair function in daily activities and or prevent attendance at work or school. Menorrhagia, a medical term for excessive bleeding, not necessarily associated with increased pain, right? Historically, cannabis has been suggested as an effective and safe treatment for dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia. 
as reported by several 19th century publications. Anecdotally, cannabis was prescribed by Queen Victoria's personal physician, Sir John Russell Reynolds, for her menstrual discomfort throughout her adult life. After 30 years of experience with cannabis, Reynolds reported that cannabis helped alleviate symptoms associated with menstruation as well as PMS itself in doses low enough to not cause cognitive impairment. These were thoughts happening in the 18th century, guys. Very interesting, right? Cannabis also has a long medicinal history dating back to the cultivation in China in 4000 BC, where Chinese Emperor Chen Neng recommended its use for female disorders amongst many other illnesses, right? So, you know, ultimately using cannabis to treat menstrual symptoms makes sense due to its well-known ability to help with pain, cramping, mood disturbances, and other common experiences women face during this time. It also makes sense based on the physiology of the endocrine and endocannabinoid systems during the premenstrual and menstrual period, since low levels of monandamide and dropping levels of progesterone are present when symptoms are worse, right? So progesterone, often associated with reduced inflammation, calm emotions, and improved resilience to stress. Women who have a steeper drop in their progesterone levels are more likely to experience severe symptoms in the premenstrual phase in cannabis and reduce most of the symptoms associated with PMS and PMDD. Women often increase their cannabis use during the premenstrual and menstrual phases, time when, yes, anandamide is lower and symptoms are pronounced. And in addition to PMS and PMDD, cannabis can relieve the painful cramping of dysmenorrhea. Awesome, right? And so, you know, we move on to the next transition from reproductive to post-reproductive life in women, which obviously marks a significant milestone with many physical plus psychological changes and numerous symptoms that can impact quality of life. Menopause is usually defined as the permanent end of menstruation occurring 12 months after the last menstrual cycle. The average age of menopause is 51 years and perimenopause describes the symptomatic time leading up to it and lasts an average of four years. The most common symptoms are hot flashes and night sweats considered vasomotor symptoms occurring in around 80% of women. Hot flashes can be triggered by warm environments or emotional stress and involve more than just feeling hot. Sweating, chills, headaches, fatigue, faintness, and anxiety are often present with the heat. Other symptoms of menopause and perimenopause include poor sleep quality, 40% of women, depression, 20% of women, weight gain, changes in mood, irregular menses, breast pain, headaches, low libido, vaginal dryness, urinary symptoms, and muscle and joint symptoms, right? So, where do we look at changes in the endocannabinoid system? Well, of course, they're accompanying the hormonal changes occurring during both perimenopause and menopause. So rodent studies, right, indicate that cannabinoid treatments include improve postovariectomy, a model of menopause complications. They also reduce anxiety and improve basal relaxation, suggesting that cannabinoid-based therapies may be particularly effective for treating symptoms of menopause. So, you know, looking to a human survey from this, a 2016 survey of 115 menopausal and postmenopausal women found that cannabis was perceived to be helpful but not equally effective for all symptoms. More women reported benefits and symptoms commonly known to respond to cannabis like muscle and joint discomfort, irritability, sleep problems, depression, anxiety, and hot flashes, and other symptoms like heart discomfort, exhaustion, vaginal dryness, and bladder problems. Authors also noted that many of the symptoms most likely helped by cannabis were those least likely to respond to hormone therapy, and this may make cannabis an attractive addition to hormone therapy for some women, right? And we talk about hormone therapy. Hormone therapy can be good, right, if we do not have cardiovascular risk going in, you know, and we look at some of these other factors, you know, definitely not ruling out hormone therapy as all bad, right? Estrogen-based hormone therapy, you know, in the wrong circumstances can be, right, causes of cancer, causes of cardiovascular issues, things that we want to avoid. So anyways, more recent study covered in August of 2022, surveyed 131 perimenopausal and 127 postmenopausal women. These top three, the top three related menopause symptoms reported using cannabis for were sleep disturbance, mood and anxiety, and libido. The two groups gave similar responses except more perimenopausal participants reported using cannabis to treat mood and anxiety and reported using cannabis edibles. So you look at really, really, you know, an entire situation with significant changes in life, of course, acceptance, you know, is definitely a part of the process and it doesn't necessarily come right away it's like you know of course life is going to 
take you through your own journey, right? And so anyways, you know, where can cannabis also perhaps have a capacity to relieve some of the distress and open up and illuminate, you know, your opportunities to, you know, have a good experience. And even on that, you know, cannabis literally has a capacity to help support sexual health, you know, and that's even in there too. And, you know, kind of another lesson that I'm not necessarily going to get into right now, but, you know, some very interesting stuff that comes out of it. And let's kind of contrast, let's contrast this to, um, estrogen, right? So estrogen and other bioidentical hormones can also provide significant improvements in symptoms and prevent menopause related conditions. Data from non bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, like horse derived estrogens given orally, such as Premarin without the protective effects of progesterone, a lot of fear and misconceptions about the adverse effects of hormones abound. It's warranted because the use of Premarin was associated with increased rates of cardiovascular events and breast cancer. The intelligent use of bioidentical hormone replacement, however, does not carry the same risk and actually has a protective effect on the cardiovascular system and can decrease, right, the risk of breast cancer. So, you know, bioidentical hormones, when they are prescribed properly, there can also, you know, obviously be great situations, but it just even goes to show even more of the potential concern that one may know, see when, you know, over the counter hormone replacement therapy, whether it's, you know, starting with progestin only now, you know, what is it going to evolve to? How can we keep our healthcare providers more, you know, involved with care and making decisions, right? So let's talk about the last one, endometriosis, a common chronic inflammatory condition in women involving the growth of endometrial like tissue outside the uterus. It's a fairly common condition with prevalence rates of the disease that have been estimated five to 11% of reproductive age women. It can also affect postmenopausal women, two to 5% of cases. Endometriosis is associated with a variety of symptoms, including chronic pelvic pain, fatigue, dysmenorrhea, aka period pain, dyspareunia, painful sex, dyschezia, painful bowel movements, and dysuria, pain related to urination. Now, anxiety, depression, IBS, Gastro -like, gastrointestinal-like symptoms and fatigue often accompany this condition, and these symptoms have substantial impacts on many aspects of quality of life, including social, academic, work, and, social, and sexual relationships. Now, where do we look at what the endocannabinoid role the endocannabinoid system plays? You know, we, we look at it as a whole. So endometrial tissue grows outside the uterine cavity in the setting of disrupted progesterone and estrogen signaling, which is characterized by progesterone resistance in estrogen dominance. This hormone imbalance leads to heightened inflammation, proliferation of endometrial cells and angiogenesis, the growth of blood vessels and likely increases the pelvic pain of the disease. Recent studies have suggested that a dysfunction in the endocannabinoid system can contribute to endometriosis, right? What do you know? One animal study found that CB1 and CB2 activation prevented proliferation and triggered apoptosis or programmed cell death in endometrio endometriotic tissue. Another study compared blood endocannabinoid levels and endometrial tissue, tissue biopsy levels of endocannabinoids and CB receptors in women without endometriosis. The researchers found an association of increased circulating anandamide and 2-AG, that's your CBD, endocannabinoid, right? With decreased local CB1 expression in the endometriosis, suggesting that a decrease of CB1 receptors in the endometriotic tissue, disrupting the homeostatic function of the endocannabinoid system in this condition. Progesterone is protective against the development of endometriosis and reduced sensitivity resistance. The progesterone allows the disease to flourish. Some of progesterone's anti-inflammatory activities in the urus occur via progesterone's ability to trigger increased production of CB1 receptors, but this seems to be lost in women with endometriosis. Progesterone's inability to upregulate CB1 receptors in endometriosis explain the observations from the previous Memphis study. Endometriosis has been described as a condition caused by endocannabinoid deficiency, although more accurate to think of the endocannabinoid system dysfunction, not simply, not simply deficiency as a contributing factor. Decreased CB1 receptors in the endometrium and decreased responsiveness to progesterone likely result in compensatory higher levels of circulatory endocannabinoids as the body does whatever it can to stimulate the CB1 receptors that are present. Negative feedback loop. Beyond the 
endocannabinoid system's role here in the growth of endometrial tissue outside the uterus, the reduced endocannabinoid system function is also linked to a more severe pain experience. Thus, it makes sense that the endocannabinoid system could be a good target for both symptoms of the underlying causes of endometriosis, right? What do you look at that's out there? You know, you're looking at opioids, you're looking at NSAIDs, right? And again, just to be able to take something to get throughout the day, you know, it's very interesting. So anyways, um, looking at some more data from another self-reported endometriosis app, 252 users who recorded self-rated symptoms before and after 16,193 cannabis use sessions. Subject reported benefits in all symptoms with inhaled delivery showing higher efficacy for pain and oral delivery superior for mood and GI symptoms. Higher levels of THC were more effective in older women had even higher rates of relief than younger women. Another survey showed similar findings. 484 women in Australia with endometriosis, the 48 cannabis users reported significant effectiveness in pain reduction, 7.6 out of 10, with 10 being the most effective. 56% were able to use cannabis to reduce pharmaceutical medications by at least half. That's a win. The greatest improvements were reported were for sleep, nausea, vomiting, but subjects also reported good results with anxiety, depression, and fatigue. Interestingly enough, cannabis had less reported adverse effects than yoga or heat packs, right? In another survey of 213 women in New Zealand with self-reported endometriosis, the most common symptoms treated with cannabis were pain, sleep, and these are both at 95.5%, and report, respondents reported that their symptom was much better for pain, 81%, and then sleep, 79%, and nausea and vomiting, 61%. As seen with cannabis use, 81.4% were able to reduce their medications and 59% were able to completely stop opioids, right? Completely stop. And 40% of those people were on it, right? One of the most popular analgesics when it comes to you know, endometriosis and a lot of other things, way over prescribed. But we totally get that, you know, it's pain that I couldn't even comprehend, right? So I'm not... Definitely not getting on that, but I'm just trying to give options for those who perhaps may not want to have these opioid doses so high, right? So let's take a look, you know, basically in summary, women with endometriosis have been shown to have higher circulating levels of endocannabinoids and lower levels of CB1 receptors in their endometriotic tissue biopsies, indicating endocannabinoid system dysfunction in conjunction with hormone imbalance. Survey data strongly suggests that cannabis is effective for addressing the symptoms of endometriosis and enabling women to decrease or stop using drugs like opioids. Like many painful conditions, endometriosis may respond best to a combination of delivery methods. To address a variety of symptoms, and THC right here is likely the most important constituent when it comes to cannabinoids for symptom relief. Now, many ways to skin the cats there, but definitely want to make sure you know, our options are available, especially, you know, if you're in a pinch and if you're in a rut right? and maybe you got questions or something like that. Well, you know, I've got resources, right? So I'm here for you there I can read a lot of this on the blog. I've got a lot of the studies attached to it and you go from there, right? But we understand how research, you know, people want to do their own research. This is not anything to impose rather than just share. That's all. And, you know, you think of all the great things that are out there in this world for options. And that's a very sarcastic statement because NSAIDs not only blow up your kidneys, not only worsen your cardiovascular risk, increase your blood pressure, you know, mess up your GI tract, right? Then you move on to the you know, next level of it all opioids. And we already you know, know the issues there. So definitely come and talk to us, check it out. You know, females share with females. You know, anecdotal evidence is absolutely imperative. And, you know, I totally respect that, you know, sometimes a female may take another female's advice before they're ever going to take mine when it comes to female related issue by any means. Right. And so that's totally cool. You know, I want you to be comfortable in whatever environment you need to be in to make the best decisions. So you can just be healthy, happy, and your best self. That's all. It's all that's what it's all about. So in our community spotlight brought to you by the Big Chicken Farm today, guys, we just wanted to shout out the Game Billiards 
had their ribbon cutting today. Sorry we didn't get to make it, but you know, I wanted to congratulate Marshy Dickerson and the crew out there for getting this thing launched. I'm excited to go play some billiards, throw some darts, you know, check this place out. Very excited, happy that they, you know, kept this thing going from whatever it was before. And, you know, awesome to see great people in our community continue to do great things, passionate people, great people. And that's awesome. So go check them out over on Loman. I think everybody, you know, as we're a small town, I think you guys all know where this place is at. So we're absolutely wanted to support and uh, show our love there. Right. So awesome. And our last quick spotlight guys, men's health minute, men, is it your time of the month? You know, what does that even mean? Right? You know, men, though we don't bleed, we can't experience symptoms of women because of hormonal shifts. Some call it the man period. Others call it irritable male syndrome, right? Some facts there, men's testosterone levels tend to spike in the fall and drop in the spring. During March, April, and May, where are we at right now? Men in general tend to have lower levels of testosterone, which can impact their mojo and lead to more outbursts, emotional instability, irritability, and fluctuation in mood. Men experience similar symptoms to women when they go through hormonal imbalances, and many of them are similar to female menstrual cycle, including tiredness, cramps, increased sensitivity and cravings. And according to one study, around 26% of men experience these regular man periods. So, you know, as far as that loaded statements of the many of the male symptoms are similar to female symptoms, as we just completely unpacked, you know, some of the insane things that women have to go through with their bodies by the physiological nature of it all. You know, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to by any means say, you know, we hurt more than you do childbirth, child delivery, you know, menstrual pain is just something a man is never going to be able to fully understand because we can't feel it the same. Right. And so anyways, in a lighter comparison, you know, men's hormones do can and do change with the seasons. And right. As we're looking at this early springtime, you know, men are looking at perhaps the lowest their testosterone is going to be all year. Right. And when that's that way, what else could be happening? Right. You're going to have other hormonal imbalances and changes and right. Whether it's a monthly cycle or a man period or whatever you want to call it, you know, hormonal imbalance can be frustrating. And if you notice, you know, peaks and troughs and valleys there by all means, especially if you're a man, you know, over the age of 35, 40, Hormone replacement therapy isn't a bad idea. You know, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, checking out, right, your hormone levels, doing the blood tests, you know, talking to healthcare providers, and, you know, figuring out your options, right? So, again, you know, whether it's low testosterone, high estrogen, whatever it may be, and the environmental factors that could contribute to that, whether it's lifestyle, diet, genetics, you know, these are things that can be optimized, right? Whether you're optimizing your vitamin levels, your thyroid levels, you know, the things that we send to homeostasis, such as endocannabinoid levels, you know, hormonal levels, of course, are very important. And, uh, you know, and men, oddly enough, have had, you know, and maybe not so much in 2024, but there is a stigma around bioidentical hormone replacement therapy in men, right? Especially when you look at it in the athletic game, right? Barry Bonds, you know, all those guys. And when you think of it in cheating in sports and you're like, well, I'm not a cheater, so therefore I won't use hormone replacement therapy. What are you cheating if you're just trying to be your best self? So maybe some of those perceptions there perhaps are a little off. Obviously sports have their own regulations, right? If you're you know, doing these things that, you know, create an unfair advantage, of course, that's a different situation. If not, everybody's getting to play by the same rules. But uh, I mean, again, optimizing your body, you know, is something that, Right? You're going to put the best fuel in your car, you're going to change your oil, you're going to do these things. You know, I know we relate it to those, but it makes sense. And so, hope that makes sense to you. I hope everybody has a great night. Happy Tuesday. Shop high horse. We'll see you guys manana. And don't forget, Saturday, you know where to find me. High horse north me.